Welcome back and welcome to section two, virtual private clouds. In this section, we're going to take a look in detail at what VPCs or virtual private clouds are and why they're so important to the AWS ecosystem. We're going to start with an introduction to VPCs where we're going to learn the fundamentals of virtual private clouds and why it's important for cloud computing. Next, we're going to jump right in using some of the fundamentals we learned in section one in section two, we're going to look at how to build our own custom VPC. Next, we're going to look at NAT and private VPC subnets, what network address translation devices are, what are available, and how we can employ them. Next, we'll look at network access control lists and why they're useful in the context of VPCs, before moving on to look at the difference between NAT devices and Bastion hosts. After that, we're going to take a look at VPC flow logs and why they're very, very important for network security and for critical security infrastructure monitoring, and also looking at VPC peering. VPC peering is the process of joining multiple VPCs together, and while this might be out of scope for the context of the sort of application you're looking to build, they're very, very important in an enterprise context. Next, we'll look at how to clean up the custom VPC that we've created. I should note now that some of the components we build in our custom VPC are not covered by the free tier, so you may incur a couple of dollars charge. So I'm going to show you at the end of this section how to clean everything up. So I would encourage you to try and do all of this section as close together as you can in terms of time, otherwise you're going to start incurring some charges. And then finally we'll go and have a little look at some of the options we have for integrating our custom VPCs with on-premise networks. So things like VPN connections and Direct Connect. So let's get started, VPCs and their role in cloud computing. In this video, we're going to have an introduction to VPCs, why they're important to cloud computing, and some of the components that make it possible for us to build VPCs on the AWS platform. So first of all, what is a VPC? A VPC is a virtual private cloud. And essentially, it's a virtual network that closely resembles a traditional private data center with all of the benefits of using the AWS scalable infrastructure. The idea of a virtual private cloud is that you can create your own completely custom, completely bespoke, yet private network space that mimics the kind of infrastructure setup and the kind of network setup that you would create or that you could create if you deployed your application or your infrastructure on-premise data center to an on-premise data center, yet in the cloud. So it gives you the option to have complete control over network address allocation, over subnetting, routing tables, access control lists, routers, NAT devices, internet gateways, subnets, all of that kind of thing, but in a virtual fashion. So Amazon creates this virtual network for you as a virtualized layer on top of their infrastructure, and it creates a logical isolation from other virtual networks in the cloud. And this is a key difference. Obviously, with cloud computing, you're using shared network infrastructure and shared hardware infrastructure. What a VPC does is create a logical isolation, which is why it's called virtual private cloud. It's a logical isolation as opposed to a physical one. So do bear that in mind. And then of course, you have the ability to launch AWS resources, such as EC2 instances and databases that we've looked at previously within the VPC space that you've created and define the networking options and the routing, etc., that you want for that resource. So you have a number of options for connecting into your VPC. For example, you can create a VPN connection, which stands for virtual private network between your on-premise data center and your VPC to extend your own network. This is called a hybrid cloud approach. And you have complete control over your virtual networking environment, such as, as I mentioned, the selection of your own IP address range, the creation of subnets, and the configuration of route tables and network gateways. So again, the idea here is that you can mimic the kind of network that you would create in an on-premise deployment in the AWS cloud. Now, a single VPC, uh, exists within a given region across multiple availability zones. So one VPC has a one-to-one -one relationship with a region. So do bear in mind that VPCs are not cross-region. Individual regions will have to have their own VPCs 
if you're deploying a multi-region application. However, a VPC can span multiple availability zones. And of course, the idea, as we, as we know from AWS infrastructure and AWS architecture, is that we should be able to deploy applications in multiple availability zones within a given region. And the amount of network bandwidth and latency between them is so significant, or su such significant amount of bandwidth and such an insignificant latency that we don't really know that the, our application is running across multiple availability zones. Another interesting thing is that virtual private clouds or the VPC functionality is free to use, but you will pay for some of the resources within the VPC, including VPN connection hours and NAT gateways. So when you create a NAT gateway, it actually spins up a hardware device for you and you do pay a charge for keeping that running. Again, so it's very important that once you're done with this section, you do make sure you shut everything down and delete everything once you've finished using it. Now, one of the benefits of a VPC is it gives you the opportunity to have advanced security features. So you can create security groups and network access to control lists to enable inbound and outbound filtering at an, both an instance level and at a subnet level. And of course, there are a wide range of use cases for this level of access control beyond just a complex enterprise environment. Even just hosting simple public websites, commonly you will have a database layer. Any public website now probably has some kind of database to keep track of cookies and sessions and user logins. Now, of course, while you want your website to be public, you certainly don't want your database to be public. And really, it doesn't make much sense to purely secure this using a username and password. What you can do with a VPC is you can place your database instance in a private subnet such that it's not even accessible from outside of your VPC. So that means your database can only be accessed by the server running your website rather than the whole internet. And of course, this simply extrapolates if you've got multi-tier applications, there are going to be resources that you want to keep private and others which you want to be public. And finally, hosting scalable web applications in the cloud that are connecting to your data center. This is a very common use case for enterprise applications. For example, in banking, you, may ha you might have a mainframe system that's running in your on-premise data center and you have applications that are running in the cloud that need to make calls back to your back to your mainframe to pull out some information. For example, uh, you know, in, in a finance example, maybe your mainframe is running your your core legacy banking applications. Uh, you might have applications running in the cloud that need to make calls back to that mainframe. Uh, for example, to get a user's balance or to get a history of a user's uh, debit card transactions, for example. And while you're doing some more advanced data processing in the cloud. Uh, the core of your the core of your infrastructure, the core of your application is actually still on premise. And VPCs allow you to create this routing in a secure fashion, such that you can make these calls between the cloud and your on premise infrastructure. Again, so another that's another another use case of VPCs extending your on premise network into the cloud. And of course, you could also use it for disaster recovery. So for example, you might decide that you want to back up all of your data to Amazon S3, and you might have a hot spare of your database running on Amazon RDS. So as I mentioned before, with a VPC, you can actually define the IPv4 range of addresses that you want to use for your VPC in the form of CIDR blocks or classless interdomain routing. The way this works is you specify in the slash formatting. So for example, you can create anything between a slash 16 address range. You can create anything from a slash 28 all the way down to a slash 16 address. So that means you'll, you can create a VPC with anything from 16 to 65,536 IP addresses with a couple which are reserved for VPC specific functions like routing. And now AWS recommend you specify a CIDR block from the private IPv, IPv4 ranges. So these are 10.0.0.0 .0 .0 through to 10.255.255.255. And that's the 10 slash eight prefix. Then you have the 172.16.0.0 through to 172.31.255.255 address space, which is the 172.16 slash 12 prefix. And probably the one you all know from your home routing and home networking if you've ever set up a, a, an internet router or a wireless router at home, you'll probably have seen something that's either a 192.168.1.0 address 
or 192.168.0. something address. So this is this is the more the more common uh, private IPv4 range uh, from 192.168.0.0 through to 192.168.255.255, which is known as the 192.168/16 prefix. And again, an important note: there is a one-to-one -one mapping between VPCs and CIDR blocks. So when you create your VPC, you specify the CIDR block that you want to use. As I mentioned, the allowed block size is between a slash 16 netmask and a slash 28 netmask, which means you can create a VPC with anything from 16, uh, from 16 IP addresses up to 65,536 addresses. And you can also associate a single IPv6 CIDR block with an existing VPC or when you create a new VPC. So VPCs are actually fully IPv6 compliant. The CIDR block uses a fixed prefix length of slash 56, but you can't choose the range of addresses or the IPv6 CIDR block size. AWS actually assign the block to your VPC from their pool of IPv6 addresses. So slightly, slight limitation there. Most common use cases at the moment, most engineering and most architecting applications, uh, you're probably going to use an IPv4, IPv4 address range. So subnetting. Some of you may not be familiar with what this actually is. A subnet is a range of addresses in your VPC. And as you might guess, subnet is essentially subnetwork. So typically you'd want to use a public subnet for resources that need to be connected to the internet and a private subnet for resources that won't connect to the internet. So a common example of this would be a web server and a database. You'd run your web server in the public subnet because it needs to be able to accept requests or connections from, from the internet, and your database would run in a private subnet because it should never be accepting connections from the internet. And typically a subnet would reside within, uh, or must reside within one availability zone, and it cannot span availability zones. So again, while there's a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, VPCs and regions, there's also a one-to-one -one mapping between subnets and availability zones. So if we take the island region, for example, we can create a VPC that spans the whole region, but we would, if we want to deploy resources to each uh, availability zone, what we need to do is actually specify a subnet for each availability zone. So island has three availability zones, which means we would have three subnets and one VPC if we want to use all of the availability zones in the region. And now, of course, by default, all subnets within a VPC can route traffic to one another. Now, in a subnet, the first four IP addresses and the last IP address in each subnet CIDR block are not allowed to be used. These are reserved for AWS infrastructure. They represent network addresses, VPC routers, the DNS server, and an additional address address for future use, which has not been used. And the last address is actually the network broadcast address. So if you want to broadcast something or multicast, uh, or if you want, if I want to broadcast something to, to all infrastructure or all nodes or all devices in that uh, subnet, you use the last network address for broadcasting. And each subnet must be associated with a root table. And this root table specifies the allowed routes for outbound traffic leaving that subnet. And we'll see what this looks like in the next video when we actually create our MVPC hands-on. Newly created subnets are automatically associated with the main root table for the VPC. However, if we want to create a public and a private segregation between our, root uh, between our subnets, we actually need to create custom root tables. Next, we have the Internet Gateway. The Internet Gateway is a horizontally scaled, redundant, and highly available VPC component that allows communication between instances in your VPC and the internet. Now, by default, when you log into your AWS account, there is a default VPC uh, with, with a subnet for each availability zone, which is public, and that, that, uh, each of those public subnets is associated with a default root table, and each VPC has an internet gateway. So that means that every instance that you create is launched in a public subnet, which has a route out to the internet via a default internet gateway. If you want to create a custom VPC, you have to do this work yourself, and I'm going to show you how to do that in the next video. Um, but do be aware that the Internet Gateway is actually a, a component in the network in, in the network infrastructure.
Now, there should be no availability risks to the internet gateway. Amazon have designed this to be horizontally scalable and highly available, uh, and it should present no availability risks or bandwidth constraints to your network traffic. If a, now, do remember, if a subnet's traffic is routed directly to an internet gateway, it is a public subnet. And this is the default behavior in the default VPC whenever you log in for the first time to an AWS account. And all of the work we've done so far on our AWS account and all the instances we've, we've created have been in the default VPC. So that means that all, um, all of those instances have been created in a default subnet. Each of those subnets have a root in the main root table to an internet gateway, which makes them a public subnet. If a subnet's traffic is not routed to an internet gateway, it's a private subnet, and we're going to look at how to create one of those in the next video. And there is a maximum of one internet gateway per VPC. So essentially one internet gateway is all you require for a single VPC, because the idea is Amazon handles all the scaling and availability constraints for you. Next, we have network access control lists, and these act as a firewall for a subnet, and they control both inbound and outbound traffic at the subnet level. And of course, we've already looked at security groups, which act as a firewall for EC2 instances. So an access control list is basically a firewall at a subnet level, and a security group is a firewall at an instance level. And as we know, we can assign security groups to multiple instances, but it's essentially like an instance level firewall and a subnet level firewall. So it just gives you a little bit more fine grained control over how you want to allow access to your instances and to your network. And this is a, a diagram or an example of what a typical public-private subnet architecture would look like. You can see at the top here we have two private subnets. At the bottom here we have two public subnets. And what this represents is a single availability zone within a single region with multiple subnets and multiple instances. So we can see this is a typical application architecture for something like a website that also has a back-end database. So when a user connects to your service over the internet, it's going to hit one of your instances in a public subnet. And we can see these public subnets here, their instances in their root table to an internet gateway. And what these instances can do is they can communicate through your VPC to instances in a private subnet, which may be a hosting your database. However, these instances in the private subnet are not directly available or accessible from the internet. The only way they can be accessed is through other instances in your VPC. So these instances here do not have a route out to the internet via an internet gateway. The only connections they have are essentially within this VPC. So as I mentioned, there is actually a default VPC, and this is the VPC that's configured by default on your AWS account. And the reason Amazon have done this is because they want to give you something that's ready to use so you can get started doing tutorials like this one. So that VPC is ready to use. It has a slash 16 CIDR block, which means it has 65,536 IP addresses. So you can, you can allocate that many IP addresses by default in your default VPC. And it has already created one default subnet per availability zone for you. Default VPC has one internet gateway associated with it. And each of the subnets that are created by default in each availability zone are, have a route in the main root table to that internet gateway. So all subnets are public and are associated with the main root table with a rule that sends all internet traffic to the internet gateway. Instances launched into a default subnet receive both a public and a private IP address, but remember that they are internet accessible, so they are in public subnets. And instances in a default subnet also receive both public and private DNS hostnames. The default security group is created and associated with your default VPC. And the network access control list is also created and associated with your default VPC. And the default DHCP protocol is set for your AWS account and again associated with your default VPC. So the default DHCP option set specifies the Amazon provided DNS server. So for those of you who don't know, DHCP or Dynamic Host Control Protocol is the protocol that allocates IP addresses to instances. And this is the same, you have exactly the same protocol running on your home network. So if you set up a broadband router, that router acts as a DHCP server for your whole network. So that means when a new device connects, so for example, your friend comes around and connects his iPhone to your wireless network, your iPhone is going to look for the DHCP server 
and ask for an IP address on your network, and your router will respond and allocate a free IP address from its IP address range to that iPhone. Exactly the same thing happens on AWS. When you spin up an EC2 instance, the EC2 instance is going to look for the default DHCP server, which is uh, by default allocated to your default VPC, and that DHCP server will hand out an IP address, uh, both a private and a public IP address, to your instance. Just a brief word of warning, if the default VPC is deleted, you have to contact AWS to retrieve it, so it's not something you can recreate yourself.